Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this panel discussion on Red Plus. It's very good to see so many of you here. Um, I can, of course, quite understand your, your interest in the issue. Red Plus, as we'll shortly hear, is one of the most imaginative, ambitious, even audacious environmental initiatives ever undertaken. And it's also one of the most necessary. Around 12 to 18, I'm just going to set the, the scene again very, very briefly. Around 12 to 18 percent of greenhouse gas emissions come from deforestation. Cutting those emissions by reducing deforestation and forest degradation will often be the cheapest mitigation option available to governments. It's also likely to be the most felicitous because of the many additional benefits, quite apart from carbon sequestration and storage, that forests provide. They are, as many of you will very well know, crucial to hydrology, rich in biodiversity, and also provide livelihoods to millions of people. We have to keep all of those terrific benefits very closely in mind, because, and I hope our panelists and speaker will very much grapple with this, Red Plus is also just incredibly ambitious and likely in many places to fail. To understand it better, many of those who attended the last Forest Day in Cancun wanted to hear more from people who grappled with Red Plus projects at the lowest level. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce to you a group of experts who very much fit that description. Paolo Barreto, our keynote speaker, is a senior researcher from Amazon, an outstanding environmental research institute in the Brazilian Amazon. He'll tell us how to avoid deforestation in Brazil and perhaps how not to. Turning to our three highly respected panelists, we have in the middle Brer Adams from Macquarie Global Investments. He's taken a, a very long, hard look at a number of Red Plus projects from an investor's perspective. I'm looking forward to him telling us quite how crazy or not red may be. Ramon Lumbuanamo is the national director of WWF in the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is a country, of course, of extraordinary importance for forest conservation, and also a place, as we have been reminded during the current messy presidential elections in that country, with a great deal of political uncertainty. This will impact enormously on Red Plus and its future there. <coughs> Dayu Rezosudamo is an academic at C4, has a great and I hope not too painful experience looking at the historic recent efforts to get Red Plus off the ground in Indonesia. I'm enormously looking forward to hearing their views. If I could just make one advanced note for you. Um, those of you who haven't been to a forest day before will not be aware of this. We'll have a vote at the end of the session on a number of questions thrown up by it. You should all have access to a voting machine. I think they're available at the back. Um, I don't know how to work them, but I'm told it's incredibly simple. Just a matter of punching in the relevant number. You don't need to press enter. If you want to change your, your choice, you can just press in the new number. I think there is a cancel, cancel button. You don't need to hit it. And then just one final practical point. Uh, Ramon is going to speak in French, and I think there are the relevant translation bits of kit at the back also. So if somebody wants French-English translation, they should get one of those machines before he speaks. Thank you very much, and over to Paolo. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for C4 for inviting me to this uh, event. Uh, it's an honor to be here. What I'll present today is um, what's going on in Brazil in, in terms of trying to fight deforestation, and especially considering uh, uh, the last decision in, in Cancun that is related to, to red that calls for uh, several actions. Uh, against deforestation, including uh, dealing with the drivers of deforestation. I think this is a very important issue. You can think of bread of paying, pay, having payment for specific projects, but we also need to consider a broader uh, strategy. And I'll, I'll show uh, what's going on in Brazil in relation to that. 
But before going into details about Brazil, I want to show you show you a, a, a approach to consider uh, the factors associated with uh, the risk of deforestation. That I think it, uh, it's very helpful for me to understand what are the main components of these risks and how can we manage tackle uh, each each of these uh, factors. So. Uh, I like to use this approach that comes from risk management. We can consider deforestation as a risk and what are the key components of, of deforestation that we need to, to address. And there are three main components and some components that are explained. So a risk is associated firstly with a hazard and basically the key hazard is people willing and able to deforest. But people's decision to deforest, they are based on the market, the demand for forest and agriculture products. And usually they are also related to public policies, uh, especially subsidies, for example, for, for agriculture. And of course, you have the population, so factors associated with population density uh, uh, is very, are very important. The other component is exposure. The forest is there, there are people trying to deforest, but they have to have access. So transportation infrastructure is very important. So policies that uh, change transportation infrastructure are, are very important. Of course, you have also natural access to forests, for example, navigable rivers. And finally, a forest only gets deforested if it's vulnerable. And there you have biophysical factors, for example, one area with very good soil and a good climate for agriculture is much more vulnerable to deforestation than on other air with poor soil, for example. But most important for, from our perspective here is the human side of vulnerability. You have, may have rules for protecting uh, a given forest. So therefore, the existence of, or not of rules and institutions and the quality of these institutions to deal with uh, deforestation uh, are, are very important. So I like to see, you know, this, to think about the, the drivers of deforestation, to think about all these factors uh, in a comprehensive manner. So let's go to Brazil to see uh, how things are going. In, in this graph, you see deforestation rates uh, from 95 to 2010 you see a very strong variation, a long time. So a critical question is, what is driving all this variation? And some studies that we have conducted show that until recently, there was a very strong correlation of this variation with the variation of prices of uh, cattle and and soy. So there, the red is deforestation. You see green is soy price, and uh, blue is is beef. So usually, when the prices, the two prices go down together, deforestation decreases rapidly. When they grow together, deforestation increases uh, more rapidly too. But we also see in that graph in the later part, in, more recently, since 2007. There was a decoupling of this trend. You see, deforestation continued to decrease from 97, 2007 to 2010, despite the fact that uh, price, commodity prices uh, continued to increase. So, what happened there? What, what was the motive for this decoupling? And a lot of this has to do with new policies that Brazil has been adopted in recent years. In the past, uh, the Brazilian government, we already had laws and attempts to, to enforce those, those laws, but uh, with a lot of failures. For example, when you consider environmental fines, we have 9,000 fines per year, but the collection of fines, the, the total value of, of collected has been less than 1%. So, with this kind of analysis, the government was really pressured to change 
uh, enforcement practices. So 2007, they changed a lot of uh, procedures. And one, two critical things they did, one was have a economic embargo of the areas that uh, had uh, illegal deforestation. So the field inspector go there and they find an area that is illegally deforested, they map this area, and they have this area is now on the internet. People can consult. And the buyers of products from these areas, they are now liable to environmental penalties. This made, this made a, a very important difference. Another very important uh, approach was really to confiscate goods uh, associated with illegal deforestation and illegal logging. And one, the main, you know, the first big example was the confiscation of cattle in a protected area. Of course, with a, there was illegal uh, deforestation there. They confiscated 3,000 cattle inside a protected area. And more than that, they auctioned these cattle uh, very fast. In two months, for Brazil standards, this was very fast. So this was very strong sign that the government was changing the approaches to reduce deforestation. Of course, this is a very strong measure, and there is a lot of reaction. But despite of that, uh, deforestation, uh, well, the government was able to continue. And actually, there was so much pressure that uh, the former minister, Marina Silva, had to leave. There was a substitution. But the pressure to continue the, the, uh, the policies uh, was so strong that the, go the government continued uh, to implement these policies. So the big question now is, okay, we have, have, have had some success. Is this sustainable? Are we going to continue to reduce deforestation? Or is there a risk of uh, uh, you know, going back to the same uh, uh, story uh, that we have had a strong variation according to commodity prices? So when you look at this, the first thing that is striking for me is to consider that despite all these new measures, we still, in the past few years, we still have about 700,000 hectares of deforestation. So this is the first thing to note. So we still have vulnerabilities, forests that are vulnerable. And this is associated with uh, a lot of, in some of the areas, we have small land holding, holdings that have been, in most part, uh, spared from these new waves of enforcement. And it's easy to understand why, because it's socially and politically very difficult to impose this, uh, this enforcement against uh, small landholders. And I, my estimate is probably 50 to two-thirds of the remaining deforestation there is related to small holders. So it's not enough to have enforcement. We need really I think there we have a very good opportunity to apply the idea of having compensation, for example. There are several land reform projects with uh, many thousand uh, families there. Uh, so the, the idea of paying for avoided deforestation in these projects, I think they are a very interesting idea. And also we still have problems there because a lot of these uh, families, they have access to subsidized credit that ends up influencing uh, deforestation. But also we have to consider the risk that we may have increasing deforestation in the future because of this success, recent success, there's a very strong reaction and it's going on now in Congress. Actually, uh, this uh, uh, week, there will be a vote in the Senate about a proposal to change the forest code. And if the law is passed as it is, there's a chance, a risk that this is going to send a sign that, okay, we can continue to deforest because later we can have some kind of easy way to regularize what they call the, this uh, illegal deforestation. So that's, that's a very important issue. And as I said, credit is still there, although it's not written that it goes to deforestation, but in the end, since it's subsidized money, it has a, a strong role. 
in the past two, two years, the amount of credit only for the Amazon subsidized credit amounted about $2 billion, uh, and this is subsidized. So we still have, so it's a lot of money, and we still have this associated with uh, deforestation. So to solve this problem, in the long term, we really have to tackle the issue of credit, for example, to transform the sector. We have to kill these uh, bad incentives and actually save money to really invest in the incentives that promote uh, forest conservation. Uh, as I said, this amount of money dedicated to rural credit is very big, so it's, it's very influential in how people decide uh, to, to manage forest. And, then, and finally, related to transformation of the agricultural sector, it's very important to think about increasing productivity of the land that is already deforested. There's a recent study showing that only in the Amazon there are about 11 million hectares of bad pasture. So it's a huge amount of land. We have to increase productivity there. And for that, we need investment in, for example, infrastructure in the area that are already deforested, research and development, a lot of technical assistance in, in, in those areas to avoid the demand to have new deforestation. 11 million hectares is very big. Um, and to conclude, I would like to go back here and leave this as a food for thought. If you are considering reducing deforestation, it's very important to look at this whole picture, all the components that are related to uh, risk of deforestation and to, to tackle all, all that are very important. And especially, it's important to consider that a lot of these factors are outside of the forest sector. For example, infrastructure, uh, subsidy for agriculture. So we need to engage those players and sometimes fight against them. Uh, in case of Brazil, Brazil tried to have a comprehensive uh, approach, but has been very difficult to involve people, for example, in the Ministry of, of Agriculture. So it's very important to have alliances or to expose this kind of, of lack of commitment uh, within the country, within the government. So when you have uh, the need to assistance, it's very important to have time uh, to negotiate with these other players, to have the studies to show the links between all these policies, to have an eff effective uh, collaboration with all, all these players. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paolo. We'll now turn to our panelists, and I won't introduce them again one by one, but um, going from uh, Brer to Ramon, and then to Dayu, they will sit in their chairs and give us seven minutes of crunchy, thought-provoking uh, uh, introduction to their subject. Yes. So thank you very much for that introduction. It's a great honor and pleasure to be on the panel here today, and um, to be part of this august panel that follows such an inspiring start to the morning. My, uh, my reason for being here is I represent a, a company called Biocarbon, which is a specially established company focusing very much on land, like focusing exclusively on land-based carbon opportunities. And most of our investments to date have focused on red. Uh, Biocarbon is a vehicle that was established by Macquarie Bank, a Sydney financial institution, um, and has share, shareholders, Macquarie Bank, IFC, the commercial arm of the World Bank, and GFP, Global Forest Partners, which is a US-based timber fund manager. And so collectively, those three uh, shareholders have invested $25 million into, into biocarbon um, just earlier this year. Uh, we have a, right at the core of our, of our business is a partnership that we have with NGO Fauna and Flora International, where we support that NGO in, uh, in developing red projects that we believe stand a viable chance of, of being commercially sustainable in today's current and very unpredictable voluntary carbon markets. So our, our business model is to focus on projects that we believe will meet VCS and CCB and other important carbon standards and that would then generate a return from, from recognising emission reductions in, um, in, in those voluntary markets. Into the future we hope that there will be regulatory schemes that will emerge 
that will allow these projects to nest into regional, bilateral, or ultimately one day a compliance cap and trade scheme that exists more broadly. But perhaps if I just make a couple of comments on our experience to date on a, a number of projects and then make some comments generally about how we see the market outlook and how projects and how the carbon markets fit together. So we, we have focused um, very much on Southeast Asia and specifically in Indonesia where we support FFI in a couple of projects and are working with other partners on other projects. We also have projects in Ecuador and other parts of South America and are doing due diligence in a number of projects in Africa. But as I mentioned, Indonesia has been absolutely a focus for us for a number of years now. And we focused a lot on Indonesia coming after the Bali meeting of the UNFCCC when of course RED was just a very powerful concept. And since then we've been pleased to see such progress for RED. But despite that progress, we still challenge, we still face enormous uncertainties at a project level which make these projects um, high risk. So one project, for example, is in West Kalimantan, which is a small landscape project of about 40,000 hectares. And our approach there has been to support our NGO partners as they work with communities to go through a free and prior informed consent process. Meanwhile, our carbon teams spend enormous time and effort meeting IBCC best standards around the carbon performance of a project having to address permanence and leakage and all the design criteria that make those standards so, so rigorous. And a third parallel piece of work that happens specifically for that project is to understand the national framework that's evolving in Indonesia, to understand how that exists at a local and a regional level and to make sure the project moves through in a way that respects all of those different aspects to the RED framework in Indonesia. And it's on that point where we often find the greatest barriers and the greatest challenges because RED is of course so new. On the one hand, we really appreciate being in, in a jurisdiction where there is a regulatory scheme emerging, which we of course like very much because it means we understand the sort of investment environment, but equally because it's so new and the environment's changing so often, it's very hard for us to actually plan years into the future. Um, and that leads me to a key point that all project developers face, and that is very high transaction barriers. And so when, when we were raising funds for our business biocarbon, we, 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 we decided to raise $25 million and not any more because we felt, we, felt, we felt uncomfortable having to invest sums much larger than that because of the nature of, of RED. So our, our decision was to close a capital raising at $25 million and actually choose to say no to other equity investors because we thought that was about the right amount of capital that we wanted to responsibly invest into demonstration activities in red. So, as I mentioned, our business model is to support those VCS and CCB um, projects, projects that we believe can meet those standards, which, as I mentioned, does require a pretty onerous degree of rigor around each project. We're focused very much on the voluntary markets because, of course, that's all we have today. Um, those voluntary markets are very small, sort of about a billion dollars in voluntary market activity in the last year. So a billion dollars is a relatively small amount if you think about the carbon markets, which are 100 times that, and, um, and broader commodity markets. But thankfully, the forestry aspect of that voluntary market is the fastest growing. It currently represents about 20% of, of that market, and the last couple of years has been the fastest growing. So we see good opportunities in the voluntary market here and now for these few niche projects. But, um, but the real challenge for us is, is the scale, you know, what's, what's the opportunities of tomorrow? Um, and if we think about the macro picture, when we first started looking at this space, the macro picture was incredibly attractive. You know, a lot of the work by the IPCC forecast that land-based carbon would generate about 40% of the emissions abatement coming out of non-annex one countries by 2030. So it's an enormous opportunity for emission reductions. Um, but of course, Right now, we don't see those compliance markets emerging. There's great uncertainty as to when that time frame on phase three of red might actually emerge. So when we think, well, where is the scale going to come from? We think about the, the challenge. You know, there's been so much literature around what it would cost to halve deforestation, and the estimates vary from 17 through to $33 billion a year. So if you take 20 billion as an average of what's required every year, it's a very significant sum, but of course, um, it's only a fraction of, of what's required in terms of broader climate change efforts, so perhaps it is an achievable number. 
you contrast that with what public funds have been committed to date for RED, the UNEP have published data which suggests that it's about $6 billion that's been committed to RED, not per year, but over quite some years. So the challenge is to get to 20, and public funding earmarked is about six over many years. So we know that we obviously need to raise additional funds, and the market can be one source of those funds. So we've seen examples where, it's, where, where markets can work, you know, in New Zealand, for example, when they established uh, a market for carbon that recognised land-based carbon, the country moved from being a net emitter to a net sink. Um, in Australia and other jurisdictions, all the things we're talking about in the context of red are being recognised for compliance-grade carbon. Now, of course, the challenges in red plus are so much more complex, but the principle is still the same which ought to be, of course, that if you're generating emission reduction and if you're investing in land management um, that, that, that generates that, that one-ton performance, then there ought to be the appropriate value for that. So we think there is some pockets of optimism, pockets of optimism around those few cap-and-trade schemes that are emerging, California, Australia, and potentially others, that have signaled they want international red to play a role in those markets. And then from our perspective, we see the opportunity as being those jurisdictions and countries that want to support a national approach to MRV and a nesting approach that recognise a role for uh, communities and landholders that, um, that take action to generate emission reductions. So as I said, there are pockets of optimism from our perspective. Um, but what we would like to see as investors, and the reason why the activity by the private sector to date has been so small, I could name for you, there's only sort of a handful of financial institutions globally that have committed money to the sector. And the reason it's so small, of course, is because everybody's waiting for those policy signals to emerge. Ideally, we'd see something out of the UNFCCC, which provided a pathway to recognition for red in a compliance framework. But in the absence of that, policy signals coming out of California, Australia, potentially um, fast start facilities that that actually purchase performance-based emissions reductions could be an important signal. Um, and then there are other novel approaches that are often canvassed, for example, whether aviation could recognise red as a quote-unquote equivalent measure. So there are these opportunities for policy signals that could emerge that could catalyse much larger private investment. But in the meantime, we think there's a really strong and powerful role for those great demonstration projects that are happening, certainly this small scale, but very powerful in their capacity to inspire other actors and the best projects are those that have the very strong and important and lasting community benefits that respect tenure assessment that, that doesn't just deal with statutory rights but of course customary rights also. So perhaps I'll leave my comments there. for my uh, not speaking in English uh, to force you to put your headset on uh, because my uh, my finest word words come in French so bear with me yeah uh, je viens du Congo uh, en Afrique centrale où je travaille pour uh, le WWF et là nous avons uh, en charge trois projets Uh, qui travaille avec uh, la, la RED. Je travaille avec les communautés, mais aussi avec le gouvernement pour arriver à quelque chose. La RED est une option que nous avons choisie de façon volontaire pour tenter de donner une valeur monétaire à une forêt qui reste debout. Et pour qu'on y arrive, il faut que les deux parties qui sont engagées dans ce, dans ce processus soient, aient confiance l'une dans l'autre. Et pour que cette confiance s'établisse, il faut que ceux, c'est-à-dire les communautés chez nous et les gouvernements chez nous, se rendent compte que la valeur monétaire qui leur est, qui leur est attribuée, qui, qui est allouée à leur forêt, correspond réellement à la valeur que eux pensent que cette forêt vaut. De l'autre côté, ceux qui doivent financer ce, ce processus veulent savoir ce qui se passe réellement, quelles sont les, les économies qui ont été faites, 
pour que ce processus se, se, se fasse dans, la, dans, dans le meilleur euh, prospectif. Ça, c'est ça notre challenge. Et nous sommes engagés dans ce processus avec tout le monde, y compris la société civile. Il euh, y a trois principaux facteurs qui conditionnent la dégradation et la déforestation euh, au Congo. Le premier de ces facteurs, c'est l'agriculture itinérante, sur brûlé. Le deuxième facteur, c'est, à mon avis, l'exploitation forestière, aussi bien industrielle que euh, artisanale. Et le troisième facteur que beaucoup ne citent pas, que je trouve pourtant très très important, c'est la mauvaise gouvernance. Et nous nous sommes engagés en tant que VEF à essayer d'attaquer chacun de ces, de ces facteurs euh, dans le projet RED qui nous concerne. Pour ce qui est de euh, facteurs liés à la l'agriculture itinérante, notre but dans le projet RED, c'est d'essayer de stabiliser les fonds agricoles. Stabiliser les fonds agricoles en rendant l'agriculture beaucoup plus productive qu'elle ne l'est avec les méthodes actuelles. Et donc nous nous enseignons aux populations la manière de produire de façon plus efficace, c'est-à-dire rendre les terres plus productives et rendre les semences plus productives. Pour rendre les terres plus productives, il suffit seulement, je dirais suffit seulement, c'est un peu simplifié, nous avons plutôt euh, adopté le système d'agroforesterie et les petites unités de, de, de production. À cela, on voudrait associer l'utilisation optimale de l'engrais euh, minéral. Pour ce qui est de euh, l'exploitation à l'exploitation forestière, beaucoup disent que dans les forêts congolaises, la richesse des de, de espèces n'est pas très importante, c'est 4 tiges à l'hectare. Mais lorsqu'on a on excès ces tiges, ces quatre tiges à l'hectare, les dégâts sont tellement importants qu'il ne faut pas les négliger. À côté de cela, lorsqu'ils ont écrémé de meilleures valeurs, ceux qui exploitent les forêts reviennent pour faire les, les autres arbres qui ont une certaine, une certaine dimension, pour produire le bois utilisé localement. Ils viennent pour un troisième cycle pour faire le bois de déroulage. À la fin, si vous, faites le, le, vous regardez l'impact, vous observez ce que vous voyez, c'est environ deux tiers de toute la masse, la biomasse qui a été accumulée par la forêt qui part dans l'exploitation forestière. Et à côté de cette exploitation forestière euh, industrielle est associée l'exploitation euh, artisanale qui, elle, n'est pas, pas contrôlée et qui, qui est plus encore importante que l'exploitation industrielle. L'ensemble combiné crée un problème très sérieux. Et donc, nous nous sommes associés au gouvernement pour essayer de suivre, encadrer cette exploitation pour que les dégâts soient les plus minimes possibles. Nous ne pouvons pas convaincre le gouvernement congolais, qui serait d'ailleurs illusoire de notre part, de croire que ça peut s'arrêter tout simplement. Ils vont exploiter la forêt, c'est clair, et pour cela, il suffit pour que, pour que cela se fasse dans les meilleures, dans les meilleures conditions, que la société civile et tous ceux qui travaillent dans la conservation suivent la manière dont cela est fait. Sinon, on y perd tous. Et puis vient finalement la gouvernance. La gouvernance est un problème très sérieux. Le pays, c'est 1 245 000 km carrés. La gouvernance est centralisée. Jusqu'à présent, la décentralisation se fait attendre alors qu'on parlait déjà des décentralisations par province. Mais les problèmes euh, de, de, de gouvernance se pose sérieusement. Il n'y a pas de suivi pour ce qui se passe dans, dans les forêts. Les, le gouvernement n'a pas les moyens nécessaires pour suivre ça. Alors, qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire Nous avons pensé à, à, à incorporer à, dans, dans le système les communautés, à, 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 mettre, à, à, plutôt, à faire participer les communautés et les gouvernements provinciaux. Mais le problème avec les communautés, c'est que pour l'instant, avec les mouvements de population qui est, qui est, qui est, qui est qui est arrivé avec les guerres et, et euh, tous les autres mouvements sociaux qui sont, qui sont issus de ces, de, de, de ces guerres, il y a eu érosion de, euh, de, du pouvoir coutumier. Et l'érosion du pouvoir coutumier fait que personne n'écoute plus les chefs coutumiers. 
il faudrait en ce moment-là refaire la structure sociale des communautés, réorganiser les communautés pour qu'elles se prennent en charge elles-mêmes et commencent à, à, à discuter d'égal à égal, ou sinon en tout cas bien discuter avec, avec le, les exploitants forestiers et tous ceux qui, qui, qui euh, utilisent la forêt. Ça, c'est la gouvernance. Donc tous ces éléments-là mis ensemble constituent l'ossature de ce que nous faisons. Et encore, pour insuffler la, la confiance, nous avons commencé, nous sommes seulement en train de balbutier le système de suivi de la forêt, le système que nous appelons mesure, mesure, rapportage et vérification. Ce système associe la haute technologie, mais aussi le, le petit peuple. La haute technologie, c'est la télédétection qui nous aide à suivre ce que nous faisons, la, la, la ressource forestière, son, sa, sa dynamique, etc. Mais sur le terrain, nous, nous faisons en sorte que, dans la mesure du possible, les communautés soient elles-mêmes en train de suivre, pas à pas, ce qui se passe, qui a fait quoi, à quel endroit. Ça, ce sont des choses que nous sommes en train de mettre en place. Euh, ce sont des projets qui sont des projets pilotes. Nous sommes en train d'apprendre qu'est-ce que nous allons faire dans l'avenir. Euh, S'il y a des questions, je vais y répondre plus tard, mais je crois que euh, le temps qui m'est imparti est largement dépassé. Je vais m'arrêter là. Merci beaucoup. Um, all right. Um, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, given the, the time, um, I will try to give you a little bit of the flavor um, of the general situation with the respect to Red Plus. Yeah, um, until the present time. I guess uh, I will start by providing some context um, within which Red Plus is um, operating in Indonesia for those uh, who are uh, unfamiliar with the Indonesian uh, situation. There are basically five major points that I think is important to understand um, the environment within which Red is working in Indonesia or not working. The first one is deforestation, and the deforestation rate in Indonesia continues to be high. There are um, uh, uh, drivers of deforestation that are important, mostly, most importantly the conversion of forest lands to other uses, and there are variations in the deforestation rate um, among regions. Uh, some areas are uh, high and some areas are uh, very uh, low, such as Papua. The second point um, um, is important is that natural resources um, has, um, uh, is the, the pillar of the Indonesian economy still. Um, in, uh, it contributes, for instance, 70% of the total non-tax state revenue, or around 30% of GDP, just to give you a flavor. Um, the third point is that um, there are serious competition for forest lands from other sectors. Uh, namely uh, agricultural expansion in a large scale, uh, oil palm for, um, for Indonesia, as well as the um, uh, expansion of mining activities. These are observed uh, through um, by a trend of rapid land conversion to agricultural commodities and large tracts of forest areas allocated for mining activities. Um, it also is observed through increasing both foreign and domestic investments in the agribusiness and mining sector. Um, consistently, uh, mining uh, commodities have increased in terms of production, in terms of export. For instance, um, the electric generation for the entire Indonesia is 80% uh, powered by coal. Um, and a lot of the coal uh, um, deposits are found in forest lands. The third um, observation related to uh, the competition for f uh, forest lands outside for this, the forestry sector is uh, from the financial sector. The financial sector, domestic financial sector, is very supportive of oil palm and coal mining investments, for instance. In a sense, potentially competing with Red Plus uh, investments. Um, the other point uh, within which uh, uh, it's important to uh, understand is that the administration, with regard to the administration of forest lands in Indonesia, 70% uh, of forest lands uh, is, 70% uh, of the land in Indonesia is forest land and it is state land. 
and it is under the auspices of the central government. However, the decentralization has given now the local government the authority to issue licenses of forest land-based activities. Um, and a major issue related to that is the overlapping licenses allocation of forest lands, uh, um, um, and somewhat similar uh, to Brazil. Um, there is uh, uh, some, a lot of developments that uh, have been illegal, uh, so that, that the spatial planning is, uh, is very difficult to uh, be resolved. The other one, the other uh, point is the governance condition. In general, all the great strides of improvement have been achieved in the last several years in governance. There remains to be uh, major weaknesses in, for instance, effective accountability mechanisms, uh, decision making which is non transparent and non participatory in in particular with regard to natural resource uses uh, and extraction and licensing uh, the other one is that um, there is a five year cycle of political dynamics both at the national and subnational levels that uh, several studies have seen to have to affect decision on natural resources and then uh, thus potentially on red so, what is the state of play of Red Plus in Indonesia uh, today? It is basically characterized by, uh, by parallel, but often separate processes of Red at subnational and national levels. Policies and regulatory framework on Red, red, red is relatively uh, slow moving, uh, associated with uh, not only technical, but also, importantly, political reasons. Um, and national processes and legal regulatory framework affects red progress at national level and on the ground. So what has been done at the national level? As many of you know, um, Indonesia, the president of Indonesia is committed to a 26% reduction of um, greenhouse gas by 2020. However, the question of the 26% reduction versus 7% economic growth and the political process surrounding that is, has been influencing the ways in which the process of red policies and then in turn the, the uh, progress of red projects on the ground have evolved. Um, uh, what have been done at the national level is policies on suspending uh, the conversion of uh, natural forests uh, and peatland um, with the moratorium for two years. But however, uh, with the exception of licenses already in process, um, also pro projects uh, vital to the nation. Um, there, it, we, uh, Indonesia is also working on the national strategy for red. Uh, so it has started since the mid of uh, last year. And until today, it hasn't been finalized. Um, uh, there are some regulations in place for RED uh, um, related to the procedures for RED, the procedures for licensing of RED, um, but some of them um, are not uh, applied uh, uh, in particular uh, yet, in particular uh, the benefit sharing um, uh, allocations. Um, currently, the government is working on a safeguard information system. It's being developed. What about on the ground and at subnational levels? In the beginning, 2008, 2009, um, there were a lot of uh, 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 activities um, with re related to pilot uh, dem uh, red projects on the ground. There were many initiatives at the subnational level. There was strong interest and support, um, resulting at the moment about uh, 30 uh, projects of various stages. That includes very initial stages, you know, surveys, uh, also interested financiers, partners, proponents, and investors, and also projects um, uh, in process of obtaining licenses. The types of projects uh, include demonstration activities, such as the project that is uh, uh, supported by the Australian government in central Kalimantan. Also, many of them uh, take the form of restoration ecosystem licenses. Activities thus far have been focused more uh, on readiness. Uh, for instance, collecting socioeconomic data of the area and of the villages, community awareness uh, and some consultations, PDDs, um, the application of the procedures for um, applying for licenses, um, uh, trying to increase the capacity of villages, in, including the monitoring village forest, for instance, determining and clarifying boundaries, both at the village level and uh, the, the 
the project, um, establishing village institutions, um, determining livelihood alternative strategies, also, of course, collecting biophysical data, um, or, such as the forest, car forest cover. Um, what we have, what the global comparative study on red, Seaforce global comparative study on red has found is that in five uh, of on five red projects in Indonesia, um, with respect to villagers' knowledge of red plus, there are some. It appears that there are some hesitation on the part of project proponents to inform uh, affected communities of red. This is. Uh, due or associated with the fear of raising expectation uh, due to the very uncertain um, situation, uncertain environment within which RED uh, is going or not going to be implemented. Um, in general, so uh, with the exception of a donor-funded demonstration project in Santa Kalimantan, as I mentioned before, implementation on the ground has uh, evolved quite slow. Um, associated with a variety of reasons that are intricately linked to the dynamics at the national level. The first one is the legal basis for implementing RED. Example, uh, in acquiring, obtaining licenses. Uh, clarity in who has the authority to determine the management of forests, that's setting and set up projects. It takes time to obtain or resolve, uh, and, and it's very key to if the projects uh, are going to move ahead. And there's also an issue of tenure. Um, the de jure tenure with the state necessitates obtaining management rights, for instance, for a project in West Kalimantan um, to secure a village forest, which they did, uh, but only 2,000 um, hectares each. So there are three villages that have obtained uh, village uh, management rights um, that will uh, evolve later. Um, they will apply for restoration ecosystem licenses. Um, so, and the, it's, uh, at, uh, also at subnational level, the governments often have different priorities vis-a-vis uh, -vis RED. It is clear um, in several districts in Santo Kalimantan where the district uh, government is very keen on developing oil palm, for instance, suggesting the competition uh, if you know, RED projects are uh, going to be developed. Um, so um, under these conditions of uncertainty, yeah, um, uh, despite the opportunity to reduce emissions um, and also acquire other benefits, as well as improve uh, governance in, in Indonesia and in forestry in general, uh, there are issues. Um, the regulatory framework uh, is not in place, or the ones that are in place, some of them uh, are not and cannot be applied. In consistent land administration, central government, local government, and the um, linkages are not are often not um, in harmony. Um, there are tenure issues. There's community distrust. Um, uh, there's political disconnect between local government and central governments. Financial institutions strongly supporting other land-based investments that can, you know, easily compete with red. Um, in effect, implementation of Red Plus is a challenge and in many ways involve hard choices. Thank you all very much. So we've heard um, three excellent introductions to the three most important tropical forest countries. Um, we heard from the Democratic Republic of Congo, where there appears to be uh, an absence of top-level political will to work on this problem, extremely poor local-level organization, and therefore progress on RED is exceptionally difficult. We heard from Indonesia, where there is more progress, where RED plus institutions are more convincingly, I think it's fair to say, being built, where, moreover, there's been a lot of attention um, in the wake of uh, the Norwegian intervention on funding, but nonetheless, there is still a clear problem with political will, with countervailing the political, uh, a political economy which is built around extraction and in which corruption plays a large part. And I think Brer uh, very clearly um, signaled why this political will is absent. Um, there is no visibility on, on financing for Red Plus, we have no certainty where the billions of dollars that um, we all think are required to give the thing a, the chance that it deserves are going to come from. Um, compliance markets are still rather a distant dream. Um, and I would just really raise one question for our panelists. What 
in the absence of that certainty can be achieved to build confidence amongst developing forest countries that Red Plus is a goer, that they should invest political capital and resources um, in this, this initiative and perhaps show that progress is possible and thereby convince investors, even in the absence of certainty on the large amounts of money that will ultimately re be required, convince investors that this is going to be viable. And I, th I think I'd like to start this, the, the, the panelist discussion that we're now going to go to um, with Paolo, where terrific progress has been made on slowing deforestation, but Red Plus appears to be rather a minimal part of that, that story. Brazil, we know, is critical. If there's going to be a great example to convince other tropical forest countries to come along to change their political economies in the way that, that is required, they must look to Brazil. And I'd like to hear from Paulo where Red Plus may stand in this emerging effort in, in Brazil. How seriously Brazil is going to take Red Plus. Um, we'll have a short discussion, about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll open um, things to, to you guys, and I hope we'll have a good 20 minutes of, of, of vigorous discussion from the floor. Okay, uh, I think it's important to first to think why Brazil changed the policies that led to some success recently. And there are some debates about that. Um, but I think some factors uh, were important. Were important. Uh, I think in Brazil, civilian, uh, Brazil society uh, increased the awareness about uh, issues related to climate change because we had some dramatic events, uh, a huge uh, drought in the Amazon. This was in 2005. We have also increasing problems in urban areas with uh, landslides. This also raised the uh, awareness about uh, issues related to climate change. I think there was also a relationship with uh, the Brazilian uh, desire to be a major exporter of biofuels. And it's, we have production of sugarcane outside of the Amazon, but uh, this production raises the issue of is sugarcane production going to move to the Amazon or displace cattle ranching from other regions uh, to the Amazon. So Brazil was concerned with this contradiction uh, policy. Well, it's going to be hard to export ethanol if we have this risk of increasing deforestation. So I think there were, there, there were um, national, was national interest to, to have uh, this policy. And I think also it has been very important, uh, the debate about do we need more deforestation? Since we have huge you know, tracts of land that already deforest and are not properly used, why do we need more deforestation? And the studies about this showing that we have a lot of degraded land, you know, bad pasture, was also very important uh, uh, in this issue. Uh, and also the information showing we can improve productivities, productivity in, in these areas that are already deforested. So I think there is a uh, you know, many factors that help Brazil improve even without having the promise of having, you know, red money. Uh, of course, if there is money, it's going to be good. Uh, and I think there are, as I said, there are areas uh, that are uh, appropriate to have, you know, resources. In the case of, you know, smallholders, there's a lot of people there that would benefit of having this kind of project. So I think, uh, you know, without having the money, Brazil made some moves because it was important for, for the, you know, self-interest. I don't know if our other panel, our panelists would like to, to raise any comments on, on what Paolo has just said or on what each of you said in your, in your presentations. I, I, I have one question, which is to Brer. Um, are, you, are you raising your $25 million investment? And do you regret that it was as big as it was? No, no, no. 
Well, certainly, we don't, re we don't regret. Some, the reason we wouldn't, haven't raised more is simply because we don't see the sort of high quality projects that give us confidence to be able to do more. We certainly see great projects in huge volumes, but because of all the complexities with RED, most of them aren't suitable for, for, for private investment. So until we start seeing more of that track record of success where the private sector can invest in, in demonstration projects, then I think it's hard to imagine you know, the very fast scale up we need. But maybe one more general comment I'd make is um, obviously there is much that can be done in improved sp improve spatial planning and access to degraded lands. And certainly Indonesia you know, do, do, is doing great things and there's much opportunity there, which Daju would know better than me. Um, but I wanted to make a comment just about carbon markets. And certainly the world's pretty uncertain. We are, that, you know, we are far away from that compliance markets as you described as a distant dream. Um, but w when the CDM got started, that was pretty radical and confused and difficult. And it did emerge into quite a large market and it did transfer large funds into developing countries. So I think with all new markets, they're always difficult and slow to start. And there are you know, a few pockets where carbon markets might be a solution that complements other activities in red for some parts of the world, some jurisdictions. Thank you. Moi, je voudrais faire un petit commentaire à, à, au sujet de, du manque de capitaux et de, du progrès que la, la, la RED pourrait faire en, au Congo. Um, il, faut, il faut, en dépit du fait qu'il n'y a pas beaucoup d'argent qui soit investi dans, dans la RED, pour l'instant, de, de la part de la communauté internationale, il va falloir quand même à, euh, comprendre que le gouvernement congolais a fait beaucoup d'efforts, en dépit du fait qu'il n'a pas d'argent. Ils ont revu les cadres, les cadres dans lesquels opère le secteur forestier. Il y a un nouveau code forestier qui a été institué. Il y a une réforme euh, du secteur forestier qui a été entreprise. Il y a aussi euh, un, un programme de forêt et de conservation qui est, en, qui, est, qui est mis en place. Tout ça avec leurs propres moyens. Donc il y, a, il y a une certaine volonté quand même politique de faire les choses. Euh, mais il y a des questions qui se posent. La première des questions, c'est de savoir, OK, Est-ce qu'il ne s'agit pas là de « pas une sky » encore une fois Qu'on veut nous montrer, allez, quand vous mourrez, vous aurez ces, ces, ces gâteaux un jour Ça, c'est la question qui se pose. L'autre question, c'est « Ok, vous venez, vous dites 5 dollars pour la tonne, pour la tonne de carbone séquestrée. Mais si nous, si nous coupons notre forêt et que nous mettons des de palmiers à huile là-dedans, la même, la même, à une tonne équivalente, ça nous, ça nous, ça nous ramène 50 dollars. Qu'est-ce que vous en dites ?» Et de l'autre côté, ils disent euh, « Écoutez, euh, c'est bien, c'est bien tout ça. Euh, » Red, Red, c'est bien, mais euh, nous voulons bien que, que nous gardions nos forêts, mais nous avons le droit de nous développer aussi. Qu'est-ce que vous en dites Et d'autre part, il y a encore une autre question qui arrive. Ok, Red, d'accord, mais euh, dites-nous, est-ce euh, que ce sera encore une colonie, une colonie écologique que vous voulez faire en Afrique Parce que quand on vous dit de, de réduire vos, vos, vos émissions chez vous là-bas, Vous dites, euh, gardez vos forêts, on va vous aider à, 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 à les garder. Mais pourquoi est-ce que nous nous gardons les forêts alors que vous, vous ne voulez pas réduire votre train de vie Ce sont des questions qui se posent et qui sont réelles pour, pour une, un, un développement qui, 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 euh, qui, qui, qui balbutie. Voilà. Mm. 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 Do you have any comment you'd like to make um, yeah, I think uh, one thing uh, similar to Brazil, I think biofuel expansion for Indonesia is also something to watch for. Um, in terms of com competi com competition for red. Uh, however, at the moment, because the subsidy for fuel is large, it's probably not an, you know, an imminent, immediate threat. But in the long term, when the government is forced to lift the subsidy, then it might be a, a threat in terms of forest, more forest expansion and more subtraction for biofuel. Yeah. Okay, thank you all. Um, and May I invite you all to, to make any submission or raise any question that you would like to? There should be microphones in circulation. I hope there are. Yes, madam and the gentleman next to you. Madam, you, yes. Is there... Uh, okay. Do we also have microphones doing the rounds? Yeah, it's working. Great. Thanks very much. Um, my question is to the gentleman from the Congo. Um, and I just wanted to find out, we've heard a lot about pilot projects in DRC. 
um, and there's been a great deal of progress. I'm wondering how far can we push these pilot projects? In particular, I'm interested in your thoughts on who owns the carbon credits in DRC, um, and also any clarity that the government has uh, developed around land tenure. So ownership of land as well as carbon credits, because these projects, WWF, as you mentioned, is doing them. How far, though, can we push them if that remains a question? Oh, um, yeah, forgive me, Rowan. Well, let's just take a couple more questions, and then um, we'll, get, we'll get the responses of our panelists. You, sir, would you like to, and, and, a, and a, third, would a third person like to line up to a microphone? Please step up to this microphone at the back. And, yeah. Uh, my, mine is just a few comments, because what I gather from the panel is that red is not actually working. It's not working the way it should be. Um, why is it so? It means all of us, we are not doing the right thing. Red is good. People that are implementing the red are not doing the right thing. The moment we think of doing the right thing, then we will have a better red. Now, the comment I want to make is that when you look at the publication that are here, you see some picture of people that are, you know, not making it the way it should be. I used to be one of them. I was born in the forest, grew up in the forest, went to schools in the forest, went to the universities to study forest, and I came back to the forest. And most of the knowledge that I gained from the the technology or whatever that I gained, I was able to use it correctly in the local environment. I think the problem we have is that we should try as much as possible to get the people that are relevant. We are here to support them, to do the work that is the local people because they are the custodian of it, they are the first scientists in the forest, they know everything in the forest. What we should do is what we have, you know, by way of technology achieved, is what we should teach them, you know, give to them to use in order to be able to de de develop what is lacking in, in the environment. The second thing is that employment. We should do it in a way that we create employment to the people in the local environment. Not employment by giving them um, maybe monthly salary or what, but we can employ them to regenerate or to restock the existing forest. Because if you, rest, re, you, you, you restock the existing forest very well, the forest will, will, will develop. But if you now bring a, a kind of a new species, for example, in my country, Nigeria, uh, there was a time we cut all the forests of about 500 species plus to plant a particular species that is thick. Once you do that, you are changing the ecology of the soil, you are changing the ecology of the environment, you are changing the ecology of the people. Mm -hmm. I think we should try as much as possible to get the people in the rural area in the management, in the exploitation and, and, or, of the forest that where they live in. Um, so we must try as much as possible again that if we are cutting down a tree from the forest. Can I ask you to wrap up your comments okay, quite Okay, yeah, soon. that's what I want to do now. If we are cutting down a tree in the forest, we should use that tree 100%. When we get the timber or whatever planks from it, the waste from it, we must also find a means of using it so that we will not put prayer on the forest. But when we cut down a tree and then we use just about 50% of it, the 50% is waste, then we'll go back to the forest to cut. I think these are the things we should do to make red to work. Thank you very Thank much you. indeed. And you, sir, at the back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I come from Sierra Leone. Um, most of you would know that Sierra Leone um, until one year ago was the poorest country in the world. 
um, the least developed country. Um, we also are the beginning of the West African forest, rainforest. Um, we, we, we have only about 1% of the, the forest, the area forested now, but we have 33% of the biodiversity of sub saharan Africa. So we know the essence of forest. Unfortunately, being one of the poorest um, countries in the world, and um, we don't enjoy being the least developed. Um, recently, um, the Gola Forest, which is uh, one of the most important forests, it starts, it's the beginning of the forest region, as I said, in West Africa, has very huge stockpiles of diamonds. And the Gangari Hills, uh, which is also a small forest reserve, has up to 22 million ounces of gold discovered. Now, being in this deplorable state of poverty for a very long time, um, you have this huge stock of resources underneath this forest. It makes it very difficult for people to actually keep the forest and continue to enjoy poverty. Um, in, in the last three years, the reason why we've actually moved just nine species within three years is because of development in mining. We had three mining companies, um, Africa Minerals, London Mining, and Gulf Gold, which came in and started you know, being royalties. Uh, within that very short period of time, we have moved nine species from being the least developed to the ninth most least developed. And there is even um, a projection that with the, if the trend continues within the next five years, we'll move another nine species. Now, this is the issue we have in West Africa. Um, poverty and, of course, the emergence of technology, which can find minerals without having to be intrusive, is, is making reds very difficult. Um, my colleague here from Nigeria has just told you about the difficulty of engaging the local communities when they're extremely poor. And also, the fact that even the multinational companies are not adhering to local laws. So, um, it, it, this is just highlighting the difficulties. Okay. Which, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, three, three interesting uh, contributions. Um, a question which um, has clearly been put directly to Ramond, and then two, um, two submissions, uh, two creed occurs on, on behalf of local people. Um, who uh, are not be benefiting sufficiently, um, I think we would all agree, from, from this fledgling, um, bold, new um, imaginative conservation effort, um, and also reference to in commercial forestry and mining to competing um, interests in forest areas. So we'll, we'll get the response of Ramon, and perhaps we could, I could just ask our, our speakers to each name the one uh, competing pressure on the forest that they think could most easily be removed. We know that it's going to take a change of political will altogether to get red functioning, to give um, uh, forest conservation the much higher political profile, much weightier political clout that it needs. But what, what, what are the no-brainers out there in their countries of of most expertise, things that could be done um, which would have the biggest benefit to the, to the forest and perhaps ultimately the prospects of, of Red Plus in their countries. So first with Ramon, please. Do I, I answer my question first or do I? Okay. Um, um, who owns the carbon? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, the problem is in Congo we have um, a land tenure system that is dictamus, uh, meaning that uh, the state owns the land, and the custom, the, uh, the communities have a custom right to the land, which is not very well recognized. It's formally recognized, and this duality is making things very difficult. But we are trying to um, to grapple with this with this situation by um, going into the forestry code, where on its Article 22, I guess, um, the state recognizes a community forest. If these community forests are uh, institutionalized, then we can, we can uh, 
say that the carbon in those, in those forests belongs to the communities. Uh, or the other thing we can do is build a, an, arch, an architecture that will permit that um, an institution oversees the, uh, the money that is flowing through uh, this uh, uh, red process and then have a repartition key that can then help this money trickle down to the last user of the forest, which is very difficult. And that's, uh, I, I, I really uh, thank some governments uh, for the northern countries that are working with our communities to strengthen them. Norway, for instance, is doing a lot of, a lot of good with the Rain, Rain, uh, Red, Rain Foundation, yeah? Rain Foundation working on with communities for the rights to uh, and, and, and then their demand on on on, on this this type of, of, of things so we still are working on it we don't we don't have the answer right now but these are the the, um, the avenues that we are we are pursuing now okay now you you, you each have 20 seconds to do this um, and Bre you can be exempt exempt if you wish to be what what is the single no-brainer change that could be brought about which would have a most benefit to, to forests in your, in your country of speciality. What other policy change would you pick? 20 seconds. Very hard question, but um, I, would, I would probably um, decrease the, well, uh, at the moment, for instance, other, other developments are heavily subsidized in terms of the land is cheap, yeah? To, 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 so, in that sense, you know, make the land more expensive. I don't know how to say this, but so the so the competition is is decreased somewhat, and or you start to think about um, sub, maybe in at the start at least to subsidize um, more environmentally friendly projects like. Red. How about we just scrap subsidies altogether instead of <laughs> adding new ones? You know, I mean, that's just. Paolo. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, take, take, the, take out uh, subsidies from uh, you know, agriculture, rural credit, um, and also have uh, issues related to land tenure. It's a major problem, too. So these two issues are so good address. Su subsidies for other land uses, tenure problems. Yeah. Ramon, is the one you'd like to add? I think uh, for us, it's uh, mostly uh, community organization and um, uh, decentralization of power to the communities. Mm -hmm. Wholesale political change then. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, we probably have time for just one or two short, punchy questions from the floor. If anybody has one they'd like to ask, otherwise we'll move on. It's someone there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, please. Uh, all that we have heard this morning has focused on the uh, rainforest zone. I come from the dry forests of Africa in Malawi. My question has to do with the fact that the uh, productivity of agriculture in our land, where most of the pressure of population in Africa is, is about 1 ton to 1.2 tons per hectare for cereals, the main food. As long as that productivity remains so low, a lot of land clearing will go on. The question now is, if RED focuses its investment on planting new trees, you are planting trees on the very land which is still needed in large expanses to feed the people. Which means you plant trees and the people go to the forest frontier to cut some more. Should RED not be investing at the same time in increasing agricultural productivity to save the forest so that any trees you plant are not the, the displacing pressure. Okay, I'm going to cut land. you off there because we're so short of time, but it's an excellent question. I'd just like to hear a yes or no uh, answer from all, everybody up here. Should RED be investing in, in agriculture quite apart from, from, from forests? We need yes, a combination no, yes, of, of agriculture and forests. Uh, I said that when I was talking. Uh, yeah. So, yes. Bre? Yes. Dai? Okay, I go with the crowd. Okay, fine. <laughs> We're going to turn to our, to our vote now. Um, I, hope that you've, I hope that you've all got access to, to these voting machines, um, which I'm going to discover with you. Okay, our first question then. 
choose the option that best characterizes the organization that you're representing at Forest Day 5, choice of one to six options. I'll, I'll give you sort of five or seven seconds for each one. Oh, you're being counted down, fine. Okay. Fine, okay, so plenty of NGOs in the house um, and, uh, and academics too. Okay, so we know who you are. What is currently the most important barrier to design and implementation of Red Plus policies and strategies? One to five options. Ah, well, glad, glad to see plenty of disagreement there. <laughs> what is currently, oh, no, there we go again. Bisector. Our number, okay, all right. Bisector. Bisector, okay. But anyway, lack of clear international framework on red, fair enough. Here we go. What, which of the following are the most important obstacles to implementing red plus demonstration activities in specific areas on the ground? It's a complicated question, I'm afraid. One to five options. Okay, conflicts over the use of rights to forest resources, I suppose tenure then. And do we get our more nuanced, okay, no, we move on. Which of the following are the most important, oh, sorry, you're ahead of me. Community knowledge of carbon issues and how it relates to, okay, mixed picture, move on to the next question, please. What is the most important area for capacity building to, to facilitate Better implementation of Red Plus. One to six options. Okay. Communities and laws. Technical stuff, not so prominent. Okay, you obviously assume the technical stuff's done. What's the most, imp oh, okay, that's the question again. Here, here we go, yeah. So, local people and legal frameworks. So, resounding conclusions that those are the biggest concerns. Okay, what is the most important area where science can contribute to better implementation of Red Plus? One to five. Economics of land use change is very dominant. Measurement of the impacts of activities on emissions and reductions. So we remember the original point of the exercise. Okay. Economics of land use change to design better incentive schemes. Of course, it must be that one. Okay. What is the most important action that could be taken by the international community to enable countries to address the challenges of Red Plus implementation? One to five. And this is our last question. Yeah. Finance, we need to know where the, where the money's coming from, when it's coming, how much it'll be. And resoundingly, everybody seems to agree with that. Okay, I'm going to bring things to a, a close with terrific thanks to our keynote speaker, Paolo, and to our three very fine panelists, and to all of you for being here.